الحمد لله الحمد لله نستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي رب زدني علما فقال الله تعالى في القران الكريم فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدينهم سبلنا صدق الله العظيم This ayah that I have just recited to you, we talked about this ayah last time briefly, but we're going to use it as our foundation for today's khutbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah says, وَالَّذِينَ Those people, جَاهَدُوا who struggle, fina, in finding their Lord. Those people who really, really try hard. Those people who really give 100% or more than 100%. Why do they do such a hard work? To find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَنَّهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلُنَا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also helps them find Him. So it is a matter of struggle in a sense of hard work. That you have to give some luxuries of nafs to find Him. It is not possible that we disobey Him, yet we live in the fool's paradise that He is happy with us. So you have to give in And you have to give up a few things before you can get his nearness. Look at the lives of the prophets. All the prophets, they had different challenges of their times. Adam alayhi salam was challenged with his sons. Noah alayhi salam was challenged with his family as well as his people. He saw his own son dying in front of his own eyes. And he was drowned because he accepted not to sit with him in the ship. Ibrahim alayhi salam has to leave his father behind who he loved a lot. And his father never accepted faith either. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam had one son yet born of him for, to, to him. Uh, Ismail alayhi salam and had to leave him far away from him. And then another son was born, Ishaq alayhi salam. But his firstborn was away from him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Ishaq alayhi salam had Yaqub alayhi salam. And Yaqub alayhi salam had his own struggle. The son he loved the most, Yusuf, was thousands of miles away from him in another place. Yusuf alayhi salam similarly had his own struggle that he was away from his family. Musa alayhi salam, born living in the same city as his mom, yet he's being grown up in the house of the Fir'aun, can call his own mom, mom. Grows up and had to leave the city for his life. Comes back, now has to confront the person that raised him. So all of these challenges, and then he had his own struggle with his people. So all of these, and if you look at the life of each and every prophet, you will going to find that yes, they didn't have an easy life. Because they had to be the role model for the entire ummah. So they had to go through a lot, so that every person can find guidance in their lives. Look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Born without a father. An example for those who are born without a father. Lost his mom when he was just six. And out of those six years, four years he stayed away from his mom. And then went to his grandfather who he lost. Went under the care of his uncle. Then married Khadija. Had two boys They died in infancy. Buried six out of seven of his kids with his own hands. His uncle Abu Talib, he died. His wife Khadija also died. After they died, the people in Mecca gave him the challenges that are beyond our understanding. He had to take permission From the people of Makkah to re-enter the Makkah, he just went to Ta'if for a few days. 
to call them to the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to call them to Islam. He had to leave his own city and migrate to Medina and had to hide in a cave for three days for his life, for in his own city, his own family, his own people after him. And then when he's in Medina, another set of challenges after challenges after challenges. Why? Because they have to be the role model for all of us. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them all and any aspect of life that you can think of, you can find in their lives. That's why they have been brought to us as role models. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yes, you need to find me. You need to understand me. There is a special word called ma'rifah. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some ground principles or ulama have laid. That you need to understand that there is Lord, there is God. One God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that needs to be worshipped. You need to understand his qualities like Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Quddus, Al-Malik, Al-Jabbar, Al-Mutakabbir, Al-Khaliq, Al-Bari, Al-Musawwir. You have to understand these qualities. Not just know their meanings, understand their meanings. Then you will understand him. And then you need to understand what is right from wrong by his laws. Not but what you feel like. Then you need to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rulings. How he deals with in different situations. And then you need to understand that every person has to die and return to him. And will be answerable for whatever deeds that person has done. These are some ground rules. If each and every individual in this world accept these ground rules and live by these ground rules, sinning would be very difficult. And that is something that we say over and over again in when we say prayers. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. The Lord of the Day of the Judgment, in front of Him I will go and answer. So if this statement, just this statement, sticks in our head out of salah, it would be very hard to sin between the salahs. And now think about it, how many of us who pray, a lot of the people don't pray, that's unfortunate, that's not an excuse. But those who pray, how many of us understand what we are saying? And if we don't, how much effort are we making in understanding what we are saying? If we just make this much effort, five times prayers, I need to understand what I'm saying. You don't have to go for big surahs, small surahs. Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Kawthar, Surah Al-Asr, Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas, Surah Al-Nasr. Just understand them. What exactly are they? What are the meanings of these three, four, five verses? You're very intelligent people. Do not think that we are not intelligent. We are extremely intelligent people. We excel in life. We do things that are beyond understanding. So we can easily do this stuff too. But the idea is that we have to jahadu fina. Struggle means work hard. There is nothing for a man who doesn't work hard. So understanding meaning is the step number one. Then when we are standing in prayers, we need to start thinking about those meanings and instill them in our heart. So that's the point that takes you closer to Allah. Then we show them the way to us. Now think about very, very simple things. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Subhana Rabbi al-Azim. You say it many times in the prayer. Do we understand their meanings? If we do, do we really believe in those meanings? Believe is very important. Because belief changes the state of heart. When we say Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, believe in it. Once you believe in it, then you will not be scared and afraid of anything because Allah is the greatest. I worship Him. Since we do not believe in the word sometime that we utter, our iman, our faith is weakened. Even though we are praying five times a day, but yet we are a little scared and afraid. Why? Because that trust is not there. That understanding is not there. 
Now think about it. Musa alayhi salam was by himself alone. Stood in front of Fir'aun. The emperor of Egypt. Emperor of Egypt. Nuh alayhi salam alone. Who stood in front of all his people. The first time he stood he was alone. Followers came later on. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood alone in front of the harshest of Arabs, the Meccans. Why are they harshest? Because they were the most arrogant Arabs. They changed all the laws of the religion just for themselves. Anything that would apply to the rest of the Arabs, they say, don't apply to us because we are Meccans. We take care of Kaaba. We will perform Hajj, but we don't have to go to Arafah. Without Arafah, there is no hajj, but only for you guys who come from outside. Not for us. We're the Makkans. When you come here and you have to do a Umrah, you got to buy the clothes from us because your clothes are not tidy. Doesn't matter how well you wash them. Buy clothes from us. And if you don't have clothes, go around Kaaba naked. Ma'adallah. What kind of laws in Kaaba, this kind of sin is being committed? Very arrogant people. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's holy beloved prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Fir'auni ashaddu min Fir'auni Musa My Fir'aun is even harder than the Fir'aun of the Musa My Fir'aun Aba Jahl When the Fir'aun of Musa was drowning He said oh amantu bi rabbi Musa Now I believe But when Abu Jahl was dying And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud got close to him, he said, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, don't be so happy. Only Abba Jahl has died today, or is dying today. You haven't conquested the Makkah. And remember when I die, honor me, even after death, so that people may know that I used to rule Makkah. And he knows that what he is going through. But the arrogance crept in him. Ego. Abu Sufyan. Again. They tried several times to attack Prophet in Medina. Safwan ibn Umayyah. Ikrama ibn Abi Jahl. All of these people if you look. You're like really? After all these signs. A lot of them believed. After the conquest of Makkah. But prior to that, they were extremely happy. When the emperor of Persia received the letter of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he got mad at the letter for, you know, the most stupidest reason you can think of. He said, why did he put his name before my name? Why did he say the letter is from Muhammad, the messenger of God, to the emperor of Persia? Why didn't he say the emperor of Persia first? So he tore the letter in pieces. And then when the messenger of the Prophet Muhammad reached back in Medina, the Prophet said he didn't tore the letter. He tore his entire empire down. And that's what happened in few years to come. His empire was doomed. And then he wrote a letter to his governor in Yemen, Bazan. He said, I want this Prophet, so-called Prophet, to be chained and brought in front of me. And make sure you send one of your wrestlers to so that he knows how powerful and mighty we are. And a wrestler, along with a Yemeni, Yemenite, comes into the presence of the Prophet Muhammad, and he says, okay, rest, we'll talk tomorrow. Tomorrow they come in the front of Prophet Muhammad and said, that our Lord, our Lord, they would call Caesar the God, our Lord has, uh, has ordered the governor of Yemen, Bazan, to chain you and bring in front of him and the Prophet, after listening to this arrogance out of these people's mouth, he smiled. He said, we'll talk about it tomorrow. You go and rest. Tomorrow, when these people were summoned, the Prophet said, last night, my Lord killed your Lord. And his own son killed the father. He said, how is it possible? We represent Persians. We have no idea what you're saying. He says, tell that to Bazan. Last night, the emperor's son killed his own father. He said, what? If it is a lie, you have to bear the consequences. The prophet said, it's not a lie. 
You go and tell the Bazan. And when Bazan came to know about this, he is waiting and waiting and waiting. Few weeks later, a letter from Persia comes to Bazan. And the letter is not from the Caesar, so from the Cyrus, but his son. And the son writes to Bazan and said, I had to take care of my father because he was killing his own people left and right. There was a turmoil in this empire. I, for the saving of the empire, I had to get rid of him. So now, as far as that prophet's account is concerned, don't touch him, just observe him. And I want you to stay where you are. And what did Bazan did? Bazan wrote a letter to the Prophet and said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I, along with all my province, shall enter the Islam because only the Messenger of God would, knew, would know what happened the night before in Persia. And when you are so far away from Persia, even the Persian emperor's provinces knew about it after weeks. So these are the people too, who when upon seeing the truth, their hearts turn to truth. And the likes of Abu Jahl, the likes of As bin Wa'il, the likes of Abu Lahab, the likes of Utbah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, Aswad bin Muttalib, they lived with the Prophet in the city and they used to tell people, yes, Tufina, that yes, he was born among us. He lived among us, but we don't want to believe in him. Because it's a matter of tribal system. How can we let the honor of Banu Hashim supersede the honor of Banu Umayya and Banu Makhzum and Banu Saham? We cannot tolerate it. If God would want to give the prophethood to anybody, that could have been given to only two people, the most honorable one in Mecca in Ta'if. One was... Khalid ibn Walid's dad, Walid ibn Mughira. The other could have been Urwa ibn Mas'ud Thaqafi from Ta'if. Those are the honorable people. How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give his prophethood to an orphan who's poor? But Allah says what? Tu'izzu man tasha'u wa tuzillu man It is in my hand who I wish to honor. It is in my hand who I wish to dishonor. And that's exactly the claim of the Jewish people of the Medina. They said, how can we accept you when you're not from the children of Isaac? We wanted a last prophet to be born of Bani Israel. You are from Bani Ismail. We're not going to accept you as a prophet. Again, it's ego. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the same thing to them. You don't decide who becomes the prophet. I decide who becomes the prophet. But even among the children of Israel who were living in Medina, who saw the truth, like Abdullah ibn Salam, who was one of their rahib, one of their alim, he accepted Islam. And many others like him. Because they saw the truth. But then there were other people, like Uhay ibn Akhtab, Salam ibn Mushkam, the leaders of the tribes. They didn't accept it, the Prophet. They in fact came and fought against him numerous times. They tried to plot his killing in Medina. They came from Khaybar. So all of these things, the reason I'm discussing this with you is that the matter of heart is very important. Because if heart, the qulub, if they are rusty, if they are hardened, if the iman doesn't enter in them, it is easy to go away. It is easy to, easy to lose ashtray. It is easy to lose hope. Is it easy to go dismay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, work on your heart. Work on the state of your iman. Because when you enter the faith, what is the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? Alladina tabu, those who repent, wa amanu, and then believe. And after belief, amilus salihat. They do good deeds after believing. So good deeds without believing is useless. Why? Because think about it like this, that if you work for Microsoft and you expect your che- paycheck from Google, that will not going to work. Because you work for Microsoft. You didn't work for Google. 
So exactly the same way if you do good deeds, but you didn't do it for Allah, why do you expect rewards from Him? You never did it for Him. You did it for all other reasons but Him. So if you do it for Him, then you can expect reward from Him. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, work on the state of your heart. So inshallah ta'ala, next time, we will going to take this forward and look into the three-step phenomenon that the Qur'an talks about, following, obeying, and loving. These are three steps. Following, obeying, and loving. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم